Hello from IDEA. This session, we want your proposal, is about submitting a short talk for the IDEA annual session and exhibition. On the next slide, you'll see that speaking to you today is Robert Spears. I'm the Associate Dean for Student and Academic Affairs at the University of Texas School of Dentistry at Houston. Next slide shows that I have nothing to disclose. I have no financial relationships with any commercial entity or anything that I need to reveal relative to this session. So on our next slide, you'll see that our learning objectives for the day are a few. So first off, I hope that you've been able to go to one of our other um, videos that we have for you to see all about submitting a proposal. Today is specifically about doing the short talk session format. A lot of people have not been exposed to this or don't know much about it. And the associations actually look at trying to make this more a part of our uh, annual session. So we're going to talk about that format. We'll understand the criteria for coming up with a successful program. Look at pros and cons of this type of format. This may be the format or it may not be the format for you in putting forward a proposal. We'll then identif identify key timelines and steps relative to submitting your proposal and then talk about briefly at the end, linking to the conference theme and other things that will be of importance to you in trying to put forward a proposal. So on our next slide, this basically shows kind of there's different types of things you can apply to when you submit an abstract for the idea sessions. And most of you have probably done an educational session in the past, or this may be your first time, but this is a lot of where some of our users will go to be able to do an oral session that's of typically can be 20 minutes up to an hour and a half in length versus some of the other ones. So I'm specifically going to talk about an educational session in a specific format of short talks. So next slide, what we'll see is what actually is a short talk. So what we'll see is there's a two different types of formats I'm going to talk about today for short talks. In our traditional short talk format, it's a case of where we have multiple speakers who will do about a five minute talk and they'll discuss on things specific to their school, to their the topic, um, whatever it may be, but multiple speakers talking across the allotted time. These short talk sessions are typically given 60 or 90 minutes in length to do this. So you can do some easy math and figure about how many people would be speaking in that sort of format. So if you're submitting an abstract for a short talk session in this traditional format, it's not that you have to have every one of your speakers identified for this 60 or 90 minute seminar. However, it does help the annual session planning committee if you've got at least some of the people or at least some of the ideas of what the talks will be during the session. If it's just a blank slate with no uh, speakers, with no information relative to what the talks might be, it's kind of hard to take it on faith that this session is going to work out well. So the more information you can give, the more information you provide, the stronger it will make your abstract be when you submit it. Then on the next slide, what you'll see is, this is a little bit different. So we, instead of just doing the short talks, the typical five minute process that we've had in the past, ideas actually look to maybe bring in a couple different things. So one of the best ways you can go about the short talks is to work through either your section that you might be a part of, so an example of this is some of the past short talks we've had that have been traditionally uh, at the meeting and very strong ones have been on technology, basic sciences, and there's a teaching and learning uh, short talk workshop that's been given for many years. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find something, an idea, a format, a session that will reach out to multiple peoples, people within our membership. If you have an idea of a potential workshop, but it's only going to have a limited appeal to a very few people that may not be the strongest one that you can put forward. Most of these short talks are attended by a lot of people. Um, we have to make sure we got a large enough room for it. So we're looking for proposals on short talk sessions that would be of interest to a large number of people. So as you can see here, doing five minute short talks, and really it's only about you know, five slides or so in a five minute short talk. If you're doing a 60 minute session, you can typically get about 10 short talks involved in that. So 10 times five minutes each, that'd be 50 minutes. That leaves a little bit of time at the start and the more, like, more importantly, time at the end for some questions at the end. There's not a lot of time for questions during the short talks. Usually there's a follow up at the end or you meet with the speakers after the session is over with. And then for a 90 minute session, again, you can figure about 16 or so 
Five minutes times 16 would be 80 minutes, leaving some time for discussion before and after. So it gives you a rough idea of how many sessions you're looking at and that it would be part of a session. So you figure if you can get 10 and only really around 10, maybe a 60 minute session is long enough. If you feel confident that you have 16 or more and you have no problems getting that number of people to submit, maybe the 90 minute session is best for what you're trying to do. And then on the next slide, instead of just the five minute format, there is a different way that you can go about doing this in one of these 60 or 9 minute sessions. But this is a case where you can provide more time for each presentation. And so in this type of format, what you're usually giving is about 10 minutes for each speaker, um, following the same sort of format, having multiple speakers. But again, in a 60 minute session, you could probably have about five different talks. Five times 10 would be 50 minutes. And then the 90 minute one, if you're doing 10, you'd have about eight presentations or so to get you about 80 minutes leaving time for discussion before and after. The advantage of this sort of format is that it gives you more time for your speakers to go into a little bit more detail. Five minute talk goes pretty quick. There's definitely a talent that goes into being able to get up and get your point across in that five minutes. Here, you're giving people a little bit more time, 2%, but again, because of that, it would limit the number of speakers that you would have available to you. So you kind of have to weigh the pros and cons of is the traditional five minute short talk better or is maybe coming up with a 10 minute format better for what you're trying to do um, for this one i'd say it's better to have all of it pieced out as far as what you're trying to do relative to uh, your speakers so a you know five speaker short talk format in 60 minutes it'd be best if you could lay out for the reviewers who all would be speaking what the topics are what they're going to be presenting on as much information as you can give as possible anytime you submit abstracts just goes towards you being you having a stronger abstract and something that reviewers can really see the value of. On our next slide, what you'll see is I'm going to talk in the next two slides about pros and cons of this short talk format. Because one of the things that you really have to do on this is decide for yourself and maybe if you have someone else who's helping you with the session. Is the short talk format the best format for what you're trying to do? So first off, pros, one thing that we've seen relative to our short talks and why we're trying to go with more of these is that they spark a lot of widespread interest. There's never, um, oftentimes they're standing room only and it's lots and lots of people coming because it's a, a topic of interest to a lot of people. You know, when we talk about technology, basic sciences, teaching and learning, those are things that are of widespread interest to a lot of different people, so they always get a heavy attendance on these things. Timing. One of the things for this is that speakers are able to discuss one critical issue, technique, or model in a very clear, concise manner. It's easy for the audience to follow. As a five-minute talk in particular, you have to really be concise to the point as far as what you're wanting that, you know, to get across to your audience. And most people who've done these do a really great job of taking that five minutes and getting across everything they need, staying engaged. I can speak personally from this is when I've attended the short talk formats, having a different speaker every five minutes, potentially 10 minutes, keeps me on task and keeps me engaged in the process. Um, I can stay focused. And right about the time that maybe I was losing my focus, oh, it's time for another speaker. So I think it's a great way to um, keep your audience engaged in what's happening in your process. Lastly, multiple speakers. So one of the things I've also valued and most of our membership speaks positively about is that you have multiple speakers presenting on a topic. So you get to hear a lot of different perspectives. You'll oftentimes hear how multiple schools are handling an issue that's of importance to a lot of us. So that tends to get people to want to attend these sessions because they're hearing lots of different ideas about something that's of critical importance to them. Now, if you look on the next slide relative to cons of doing this format, you'll see is oftentimes people come in and they try and accomplish too much in one of these sessions. They try and make it be all, end all, and everything that they want to try and put into this. You really have to stay on the task at hand. What is the main point that you're wanting your speakers to get across and making your speakers understand that, you know, they've got a very short window of time to work within. So it's you know, they need to be really focused on what the topic is all about. So timing, and I can tell you, as an organizer, it's sometimes difficult to keep those speakers on task. So oftentimes, when you put out a call for speakers, 
um, you'll see at the very end, you know, you may not know all the speakers involved with the form with who applies for this. Um, is this somebody who tends to be very wordy and the thought of them finishing up in five minutes or 10 minutes? Um, some people just aren't very good at that. So you really have to be very organized as that organizer and keeping people on task. And when you're looking at the abstract and who submits, sometimes that can be a little bit difficult. And then that third bullet point about the topic must fit the format. Not every topic fits short talks. Um, you know, oftentimes they're better served being a 60 minute, 90 minute standalone seminar or educational piece. Maybe they're better served going into things like a poster or something else. So one thing I wanna make sure that people understand is just because you're submitting something for a short talk session does not guarantee acceptance of your abstract. This still has to be something that is appropriate that is of broad interest to our membership and is something that will fit this format. So um, it's a great format if it fits what you're trying to do, but just don't think, oh, I'll do the short talk because that's gonna get me acceptance. Doesn't work that way. On our next slide, what you'll see is this is um, the review process and timeline for all of the sessions. So what you'll notice is typically for any sort of educational session, the date of acceptance is June 1. Uh, you know, right after the meeting, when we're done in March, the acceptance, you know, the portal opens up, you're able to submit your abstract at that point in time, it goes through June 1. So if you want to do one of the short talk sessions, you really have to get after it and really have everything lined up, especially if you're trying to get as many speakers as possible definitively lined up for what you're trying to propose in your abstract. This is something you've got to be aware of the timing for this. Then you'll see through the rest of the slide how it's going to go through review and eventually acceptance. So just always be aware that for those um, any educational session, short talks included, you have to really get on top of it because that June 1 deadline comes up very quickly. Next slide. So what you'll see is we're going to talk just briefly about the format or theme for the conference. So on the bottom right hand corner, you'll see for our next slide or for our next session, excuse me, that you know it's all about discovering your pathway. And so we say the same thing for this that we would for any other type of educational session you might be submitting. You always want to be aware of what the theme of the session is, but don't force the theme into your abstract or what you're trying to do. Sometimes people think that if they include the words discover your pathway into their abstract, the title or within it, that that's going to get them a higher degree of acceptance rate. And again, that's not the case. Um, how does your abstract fit into what the theme of the session is very important, but you don't have to state the title of the theme in that. It's always a case of looking to see how does your um, short talk format fit the membership. Is it something of broad interest? Is it something that is innovative, exciting? The typical things we look for in any session apply to our short talks as well. Next slide. So again, finding that right match. So one thing to do in coming up with a, a short talk theme, it's making sure that it's not just of interest to you, but interest to a broad area of people. So this is where, you know, things, if you've been attending uh, any of the sections, council of sections committees, they often will submit short talks on their own. So get with your section members to hear what's of interest to them, and we'll, you know, maybe you can get multiple people within the section to help sponsor one of these sessions. What are the hot topics out there? We all know if we've kept up with things like um, Journal of Dental Education or any of our other educational journals, what are the topics that are um, issues for everyone? You know, we all know there's things that we're all struggling with that we all want more information about. Here's a great opportunity to take one of those things that's a hot topic, an innovative topic, and do a session on it. People are always wanting to hear more about things that are of issue for all of us. Um, the other thing I'd say is when you're trying to put one of these sessions together, you know, building and putting it together, if you have help, getting a co-abstract um, presenter, someone who can help you chair the session is a great idea. You want multiple people involved if you can, helping you figure out the best abstracts and coming up with the best abstracts to review, that is, and then coming up with the best way to write your abstract. Get as many eyes on your abstract as you can so that you've created something that a review committee will think is 
something they want for their membership. Next, what you'll see is the rubric. And I cannot stress enough to you following the rubric. If you've not seen the session on submitting an abstract, please go in and go do that because we go through you through with you all about this rubric and what this means. So just briefly, what you'll see is on that left-hand column, the criteria that your abstract is going to be reviewed under. Content, clarity, format, professional writing, and contribution. And you see the difference between excellent versus needing improvement. The reviewers of your abstract are going to be using this rubric to go through and determine have you done an excellent job on these different criteria area. And as you're writing your abstract, you need to keep the rubric in mind because if you understand and you write towards the rubric, then you should have a better chance of success when people review your rubric. If you're not aware of the rubric, if you're not following it, you're putting yourself at a big chance of not writing an abstract that will be reviewed in a good manner. So please, please be aware of this rubric. Use it when you're writing your abstract. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that going through all this guarantees success, but it definitely puts you in a better position to be successful if you have followed the rubric. Next slide. So after you submit, as I mentioned just earlier, understand that there'll be a, a you're submitting by June 1. Remember, you must submit by the deadline. If you don't submit by the deadline, it will not be looked at later. So don't miss the deadline. And then once you've submitted it, it's going to go through three different levels of the review process. So we're doing everything we can to vet your abstract in a positive manner and make sure that it's not just one person who's determining your fate, but multiple people involved in this process, as well as the annual session program committee, multiple people, multiple eyes on your abstract to make sure that you've been given the best chance possible for acceptance to the meeting. So initially, three blind peer reviews will happen relative to um, your submission. They will all follow the rubric. They've all been calibrated, and they all know that that rubric is so important in the process. And then after it goes through the peer, the peer reviews, it then goes to the ADEA Annual Session Planning Committee, where there there's a, a lead reviewer who's been assigned to it who's also going to look at your abstract, make sure that the three peer reviews have been calibrated accordingly and have um, assessed your abstract accordingly, and then help make determinations on yes or no relative to it being accepted. And you should hear sometime back at late July relative to if it was accepted or not. Also, one of the things that's happening with the IDEA ASPC is they're making much greater effort to try and get you feedback on your abstract, what was good, what was bad, it's particularly if it's not accepted, trying to get information back to you such that you'll understand why it wasn't accepted and what you can maybe do going forward. Please understand that oftentimes in the review process, you may have written a very good abstract and it wasn't accepted for a multitude of reasons some being that we already had a lot of abstracts on the same topic. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into acceptance or not acceptance. So don't think that just because your abstract wasn't accepted, you didn't have a, you know, a good abstract. That may not be the case. So use the rubric. And then if you're not accepted, hopefully you got information back that lets you know what could be done better for the future. Next slide. So a few common errors in this process. As I mentioned earlier, forcing the theme into an abstract. Don't feel like you have to put discover your pathway into the title or that has to be part of you know, what's been put into the abstract itself. If you've written a well-crafted abstract following the rubric, that's really what you need to be doing. Um, providing statements without evidence. One of the things we all know is that the more evidence you can give relative to what you're um, citing, the better case and the stronger case you make on the importance of your abstract. So don't just make statements, bold statements in particular, without evidence backing it up. The biggest common error, and you hear me keep um, emphasizing it, but it's the case, not following the rubric. You must make sure you follow that rubric and you know it'll give you the best chance for successful. Failing to have the proposal proofread, make sure you get other people to read this, multiple eyes have been put on it. Don't have grammatical errors, don't have spelling errors. These tend to set your um, abstract up in a negative light. People will think if you don't, if you can't follow this process properly, then what's to make us think that 
you know, the um, project and then the ultimate presentation will be good. Lastly, um, for most things, um, an IRB approval is needed. There's a few instances where not. This is where I want you to just go look at the previous presentation about submitting proposals and they'll go into more detail about the IRB process relative to that. Last slide, I believe. So in summary, we've talked about short talk formats and why this might or might not be the best way for you to go. Remember, um, it works great. This is something that a lot of our members have been really uh, value, but it needs to be the best format for what you're trying to do. And again, decide what works best, the traditional five-minute talks or kind of the newer maybe 10-minute talks, which is best. Um, you need to be aware of the theme, but don't try and force it into the abstract that we've already talked about. And la one last time, rubric, rubric, rubric. Don't forget that rubric when you're writing up your abstract. So I want to thank you for being part of this process. If you have any questions, you can go on to um, the IDEA website for more information, contact one of the IDEA ASPC committee members, but IDEA is more than happy to help and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you for your attention. I hope that this session has helped and best of luck with your abstract submission.